you'd like to keep your Bibles open to Psalm chapter 3, that's where we'll be studying from this evening, Psalm 3. It's very good to be with you tonight. I always enjoy this uh, opportunity to be here and, uh, and uh, speak with you like this. Um, I've told some I don't ever like to make excuses, but we had a lock-in Friday night, so I don't think I've ever yawned while speaking before, but if I've ever felt like it, it's probably now. Um, you would be proud of our young people. Uh, I always am. Uh, they impressed me Friday night. We had a, a good crowd here, um, but uh, the, uh, the quality of the crowd was even better than the quantity. Uh, many of you are sitting where girls were sleeping Friday night, so um, we played games in several areas of the building. If you find anything funny, it's my fault. Uh, I did want to uh, praise everybody that helped me clean up, or even the few who helped clean, um, because you worked, you worked magic in so many ways. I, I went home uh, Saturday morning with the intention of coming back around 3 or 4. I don't know what time I got back over here, but when I did, things looked pretty nice, so... Um, Thank you. Thank you, everyone, that helped do that. Um, at the lock-in Friday night, I asked the young people, how do you live? Um, a question uh, that I phrased intentionally in, in that way because I wanted them to think temporal. I wanted them to think physical. And if I were to ask you, how do you live tonight? Well, uh, your answer, according to the circumstance, might be very different depending on where you are or who is asking you. If somebody were to uh, ask you how you live, you might immediately think, well, how do, how do I physically live? I live by food, or I live by my job, or uh, I live by my family, and so forth. I reminded them, as I will you tonight briefly, about how the Bible tells us in Deuteronomy chapter 8, and then again in Matthew chapter 4, that we are to not live by bread alone, right? But we are to live by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. I like to emphasize every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. This year, uh, perhaps you're tired of talking about rev uh, resolutions. I kind of am, you know. It's four days after the new year. Um, but bear with me for just a second or two. Uh, I hope that perhaps one, if not many of your resolutions, involved your spiritual growth, your, your strengthening in, in your relationship with God. And perhaps some of you have even made commitments to, to let God speak to you more through studying his word. You know, I hope that's the case. Whether you call it a resolution, you know, even if it's just a, something you want to do better this time of year, you know, which is a resolution. I, I, I hope that you have made a desire or an attempt to let God speak to you more through reading and studying his word. Um, that being said, we talked at our lock-in some about this. I'm reminded of how the Psalms are, are so uh, often added to Bible reading programs. Many of you are familiar with things that you've done. Perhaps you find them in the front of your Bible or things similar to the 30 days and 30 minutes card that, that, that insert Psalms or even Proverbs daily into reading. You might read Old Testament and then you'll read a Psalm. You might read New Testament and then you'll bounce back and you'll read the Psalms. You know, the Psalms are important. And, and I want to admit that they are something in my mind that I've always kind of thought like or felt like that I know. But, but until recently, I really, I really didn't grasp. You know, the Psalms to me were something that, that perhaps I, I might have been like, oh yeah, you know, I, I know about those things. For instance, I know you find them in the middle of your Bible. Remember that trick, right? And, and I can quote the 23rd, which I can, thanks to uh, this Bible school program at Hartsville Pike. I can even quote it in the, in the thou and shalleth and maketh translation. But, 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 but I want to admit, and, and maybe I'm not alone, the Psalms are really something that I don't have a great knowledge of. I will honestly say, and I think that you can, you can attest, I know more about and, and have memorized better the songs in this book than I have God's songbook, the Psalms. You know, I can tell you if, you if we sing one off key, I, I can't tell you how or make it better, but I can tell you better than I can tell you if, if I've misquoted a psalm. And, and I think we can all probably relate to that. Uh, a, a friend sent me a message that, that he had received somewhere that said something identical to that. You know, perhaps this year if we want to uh, be able to, to, to let God speak to us more, to, to strengthen our relationship with him, maybe we need to study God's songbook a little more. And so I want to commit you and also myself to, 
to kind of reevaluating some of the Psalms. And uh, I do this tonight just to, one, because I've found it so beneficial to me. And I, and I want to share that with you. I wanna give you a few interesting things about the Psalms, just kind of for fun, just maybe some things you'll, you'll step away from here tonight and go, wow, that's, that's kind of cool. Tonight, I guess, is a little different of a, of a lesson that I've spoke before. But, but I wanna give you a few things, and then I wanna focus on Psalm 3. I wanna focus on the beauty of just one Psalm here tonight. These are some things that I've been discussing in uh, my Bible class recently with the college age and, and, and beyond that age, and these are some things that uh, were very interesting to me. You look at the Psalms in the Bible and you know they're printed different, aren't they? You, you, you often have wider margins in the Psalms. That's good for note taking, right? Because they're printed a little different. Why is that? It's because they're, they're poems, they're poetry. They are writings that aren't just narratives. Sometimes they're narratives, they give historical accounts. But, but oftentimes they are narratives that have been compiled or written, in, in, inspired, but with great thought of man. Okay, I give you the example. David uh, has, has written a few psalms, and it's, and it's common for him to start the first line of every phrase with the first letters of the Hebrew alphabet. Isn't that cool? We call those acrostic psalms. You know, David was inspired when he did that, but he thoughtfully composed those words. And that's neat. The Psalms, uh, although they don't rhyme, uh, unless it's on accident in English, uh, rhyme is something that's really lost in translation, but they do rhyme in thought, and you know that. You might have just never thought of that. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me lie down in green pastures, and in the next line, he leadeth me beside still waters. They rhyme in thought. The one I always like to point out is Psalm 19. The heavens are telling of the glory of God and then followed by their expanse is declaring the work of his hands. You see how that, that, that rhymes in thought. The Psalms often do that. They're a collection of 150 Psalms, but depending on what translation you have, it might be a little different. If you have a, a translation that has placed a very high value on the Dead Sea Scrolls, you might have a Psalm 151. Or if you have a translation that has decided that a few of the psalms need to be combined, you might have fewer than 150 psalms. Don't do this now, but uh, put this in your notes and, 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 and check this out. Psalm 14, for instance, and Psalm 53 are basically identical. It's the same song. There's, there's a little difference in how the verses are divided, but it's the same thing. If you look at Psalm 42 and Psalm 43, <clears throat> there are three verses in those two psalms that are the same. Well, we think that's a chorus. Okay, a chorus of one psalm or one song. So some translations might combine those two together. So depending on what translation you have, you might have a little more, a little less than 150 psalms. The uh, ancient uh, rabbis, the Hebrew teachers, they divided the psalms into books. If many of your Bibles are open now at Psalm 3, perhaps look at the wording before Psalm 1. You might see something that says Book 1. Have you ever noticed that, Book 1? That's because there's five books in the Psalms that they divided uh, this work into. That's kind of neat to think about. And while it's so important for our kids to know that David is the author of so many Psalms, it's important for us to know that he's not the only author. The Psalms were compiled over a, a thousand year period or more, some say. How cool is that, right? To know that this book took place over that, this book was compiled from writing over that far of a period. That's pretty neat. David did write most of the Psalms that we have, or most may be incorrect. I'll have to check myself. I think it's around 70, 73 Psalms that David did write. The Psalms are popular, like I said. A neat thing about the Psalms in your Bible is that you will find them quoted in the New Testament more often than any other Old Testament book. You'll find the Psalms. And you'll find them quoted by people like Paul and people like Peter. Peter quoted a Psalm on the day of Pentecost. Okay, you'll find them quoted by our Savior, Jesus Christ. One of the neatest ones, and the one that I wanted to share briefly, do you remember in Matthew 22, when the Sadducees, lawyers, and Pharisees, they're all coming down on Jesus. They're trying to trick him up, right? And, and Jesus turns it around in verse, uh, around verse 43. He asks them a question, and he says, whose son is Christ? And how do they answer? Whose son is, is, is Jesus? They say, well, he's the son of David, right? 
And then what does Jesus do? I, I, I love it. I'm sure he did it without arrogance. He did it respectfully. He said, well, if he's David's son, then how, did, how then does David in the spirit call him Lord? He's quoting Psalm 110. And I read it quickly, but even Jesus said, how then does David in the spirit call him Christ Lord? What does that mean if we think about that? Jesus not only knew the Psalms and quoted the Psalms, but he believed them to be inspired by God. The Psalms were important to the writers of the New Testament. Um, those are just some things. The neatest thing about the Psalms, in my mind, is that they are what we call religious lyric poetry. Religious lyric poetry. And I don't know if that's uh, perhaps something that a lot of folks use or are aware of. Maybe there's a different way to say this, but this was the definition I found for re re religious lyric poem. It is reflections of the inner feelings of a person whose soul is stirred by thoughts of God. Think about that. The reflections or the, of the inner feelings of a person whose soul is stirred with thoughts of God. I found that it worded this way. The Psalms are inspired responses of various individuals to God's revelation of himself in the Old Testament. Inspired responses of individuals to God's revelation of himself. I thought about this, and, and perhaps you can share with me in this thought. When do we express our deepest inner feelings to God? I hope that we all do. If, if you don't express your feelings to God in prayer, make that a resolution for yourself this year. To find quiet time of expression to God through prayer. The answer to that is prayer. That's what prayer is, right? We, we, we express our feelings to God in prayer. How many of you, as I do, have very intimate prayers? I hope that you do. I hope that you find time to be very personal with God. And you know, to each his own, I'm not, I'm not gonna talk about how we pray tonight. It's, 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 it's not something that's important to our discussion right now. But, but I have tried through the past few years to make my prayers more personal, you know? To not, to not pray as if I'm talking um, to, to somebody that I have no relationship with, but to pray to God who I respect, who I honor, who I value so highly, but who is also my friend, my father, the being that cares for my soul so much that he sent his son to die for me. So often you won't, you won't hear me pray in some of those thou's and maketh and so forth that I said earlier. You'll, you'll hear me pray to God like, like I'm talking to a friend, but with respect. Don't hear me wrong. You know, prayers are meant to be personal, and, and, and I remind you of Jesus' lesson on prayer in Matthew 6. You remember Matthew 6, 5 and 6? It says, and when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and on the street corners that they may be seen by others. Truly, I say to you, they've received their reward. But what does he say next? But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your father who is in secret and your father who, is in, who sees in secret will reward you. If that, if that admonition is literally telling us that we can't pray in front of men, in front of people, then we've sinned tonight, haven't we? What's the, what's the scripture teaching us? What's Jesus' lesson? Make your prayers personal. Don't have your, your, your prayers affected by those who are standing around you. Don't, don't pray to be impressive to this assembly. Don't, 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 don't pray to have people think, wow, what wonderful uh, education he or she ha has because they're able to pray in such a way. I think Jesus is telling us to have that relationship with God and talk to him, and that's what we see in the Psalms. That's what we see. We see men like David and, and, and so many others, Solomon, express joy to God. We see them express anger to God. We see them express happiness as well as sadness. You know, grief and, 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 and worry as well as thankfulness for having been led through trying time. We see personal prayers to the Father. And the neatest thing, I tell you this is my favorite thing, it's, 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 it's lyric poetry. My favorite thing is that God allows us to have a glimpse into that. He allows us to, to have a glimpse into these people's personal reflections toward God through the inspired Psalms. 
I thought about this, and uh, this made even more sense to me. Um, Kelly has a box of stuff that I've given her. In two days, we will have had a relationship for eight years. Eight, isn't that right? And she has a box. I made her a box one time, and it was real small, but I was real proud of it because I crafted it, you know, and constructed it. But I used that space up in probably a half a year. You know, I had given her cards and things, and it was way better then than I am now, I'll admit it. I'm sorry, that needs to be another resolution. <laughs> But she has a box, and in that box are things that I've given her over the past eight years. You know how embarrassed I would be if I came home and one of these guys or even girls in our youth group was reading through that box? <laughs> that, that would be embarrassing for me. Why? Because those are, those are personal expressions that I have given in love to my wife. In a similar way, I am thankful that God has allowed us to see these personal expressions to him through men who loved him, men, men who, whose heart were after him, you know? We have that. We have that in this book. I've said it, but how cool is that, right? To have the Psalms. I want to share with you, uh, I want to thank God. I, I, I'm, I'm, I was reminded of the song, the, the, the ancient word song that we sang just the other night. And I'm, and I'm thankful for these ancient words that have been long preserved, handed down to us. And I, and I, and I pray that we all are. Um, briefly, as we, as we wrap up, um, I wanted to give to you tonight, this is not original to me, but I wanted to give to you tonight a way that you can have better appreciation for these psalms. You know, read them and perhaps... Uh, um, um, have more meaning impressed upon you from them. And, and, and these things that I've said before are really cool. You know, keep those in your mind. But there's a way to read the Psalms, I feel, and, 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 and really gain a, a greater grasp of them. And this isn't original to me, but I can't remember who uh, got this method or who gave me this method. But it involves three steps. It involves knowing or, or, or carefully looking at the superscription that means just the title of the psalm. Psalm 3 has one. There's 116 psalms that have titles, okay? Look at the superscription. Try to find its context, okay? Why and when and where it was written in the Old Testament. And then make it personably applicable, uh, applicable but use the New Testament, okay? See where that psalm fits into the New Testament. See if it has New Testament application. Sometimes the New Testament application is very direct, you know? Uh, we, we see direct quotation of the Psalms in the New Testament. Like I said, over 100 times we see the Psalms in the New Testament. But sometimes the application is very indirect, but it's meaningful to us New Testament Christians. So again, pay, pay, pay attention to the superscription, find the context, and then apply it according to the New Testament. Let's, let's, let's do that for just a second. I want to kind of show you how this works and build Psalm 3 into something you can take with you tonight. I have found love in Psalm 3, as I know I would every psalm if I did this too. If I spent the time to do this with, I know I would find the same joy. But, but, but I did this with Psalm 3, and I wanted to share it with you. For instance, the superscription. Again, I just said it's a title. And, and I know many of you are, are saying, and rightfully so, well, Stephen, that title's not inspired. You know, it's not a, it's not a God, uh, divinely inspired title. And that's true. But did you know most of these titles are really, really, really old some of them even dating back to when the text was translated into Greek. We call that the, the, the Septuagint of the third century BC. That's before Jesus, that's old. We find some of these superscriptions. So I think, I think they're worthy to pay attention to. They're worthy to take a look at. And we trust a lot of them. You know, how many of us have been reading the Psalms and we say, David, oh wait, did David write that? And then what do we do? We check the superscription, right? So pay attention to some of them. Uh, superscriptions, um, we find things in them like, uh, like where, who, who is the author, uh, where the context is. We find what type of literature it is, whether it's a song, whether it's a prayer, how it was meant to be sang or played. One of my favorites is Psalm 45. In, in your Bibles, keep a finger at Psalm 3, but go over to Psalm 45 real quick and look at this superscription. <clears throat> be fun to have all you say it. It's got a big word in it. Psalm 45, my, my superscription in the New American Standard text says, for the choir director, according to the, here you go, here's your fun word if you've got it like me, 
Shashanim, a mascal of the sons of Korah, a song of love. Okay, Shoshanan is what I want to, is what I like. I like seeing that. I'm not sure what that is, but history tells me that that can also be translated lilies. Do any of you have lilies? And lilies is a, is, is melody of a song. Isn't that cool? That's how that song is to be sang. Upstairs in Bible travels, in the sparrow's nest, I don't know if it's still there, but somebody's written a song, and I forget what the song is right now. This just came to mind, but it says, sing to the, to the tune of 10 little Indians. Or is it drummers? I don't know. But that's the same thing, right? Same thing. Sing this song to the tune of lilies. That's pretty neat. I like to take a look at these superscriptions, as you can see. Well, the superscription of Psalm 3, go back to Psalm 3, says, A Psalm of David, who fled from Absalom, his son. Okay? We find that story in 2 Samuel chapter 15 through about chapter 19 of the Old Testament text. Uh, a psalm of David who fled from Absalom, his son. Some of you also have a morning psalm. And if you have that, that's cool, but that's a recent edition. Okay, they've, they've taken psalms that talk about the morning and psalms that talk about protection. And we have found out that the ancients used to say those psalms in the morning, a prayer of protection in the morning for God to get me through the day. And if you look at verse five, uh, five that Blake read, it does talk about the morning. I lay down and slept and I awoke and the Lord sustains me, right? So sometimes these are psalms of the morning. I talked about uh, morning poetry just a little bit Wednesday night. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Poetry out of Lamentations. So it's kind of neat there. But the superscription is important. And the superscription leads us to that number two thing, right? The context. Uh, the story of Absalom. I want to admit something to you tonight. In preparation for this, I studied the story of Absalom. I probably shouldn't have done that. I spent too much time in Absalom. And then when I compiled what I wanted to say to you tonight, I have all this Absalom information that I don't need to talk about and that I can't talk about in 15 minutes. But some of you know the story of Absalom. Some of you remember it. And, I, and I'll summarize it. This is a quick, this big summary. David has become king of all of Israel. Okay, 2 Samuel chapter 5 tells us that. He's run the table, if you will. His win-loss record is being shown and he has a lot of wins. He has made Jerusalem the capital city, okay? He's befriended the Phoenicians. He's defeated the Philistines. He's taken over the Moabites. He has besieged the Arameans. The Arameans are important there because when he took over Syria, basically, Aram, he got a wife, and that wife gave him Absalom, okay? So the Arameans are kind of important to the story. He's done the same to the Edomites, the Ammonites, and all of the independent Canaanite cities. The uh, New American Standard Study Bible, I found this, says, His wars thus completed the conquest began by Joshua and secured all the borders of Israel. His entire empire reached from the eastern arm of the Red Sea to the, the Euphrates River. Okay? So he has, like I said, he has run the table. He has grown comfortable. He has grown, this is David, he has grown complacent, no doubt, and he has gotten involved in a big sin, a big mistake, namely Bathsheba, right? And because of his sin with Bathsheba, the prophet Nathan tells him in the Bible uh, that now therefore the sword, you remember this, shall never depart from your house because you have despised me and have taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. Thus says the Lord, behold, I will raise up evil against you and out of your own house. You hear that? That's important. Evil from your own house. I will take your wives before your eyes. I will give them to your neighbor and he will lie with your wives in the sight of this very son. For you did this in secret, but I will do this thing to you for all of Israel to see under the sun. Not a good day for David, huh? Well, the prophecy we know comes true. And it comes true in several different ways, but one of the largest ways it comes true is through the story of Absalom, David's son. The son who, it's a long story, like I said, I wish I had more time, but it's the long story of how Absalom conspires to take the kingdom from David. And what does David have to do? He has to flee Jerusalem. Ironically, before he leaves, before he gets too far away from Jerusalem, he cries or mourns on the Mount of Olives. Does it sound familiar? And then he also, he crosses the Jordan, okay? What does that symbolize? That's important in, 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 in Bible study. He has removed himself from God's 
holy land completely. He's out of there, living in the wilderness, the text tells us, probably without a comfortable place to lay his head. He's had to run from Absalom. David's life is in danger. His administration has been just dismantled. There are people who were once loyal to him, now they've turned their backs, they're loyal to Absalom. His family has been broken apart, and it's without doubt that he's tormented by that pain. I didn't tell you the story of Absalom, but do you remember? Uh, the story involves his daughter being raped by his, his son, by his own son, by, by her stepbrother. I believe that's, that's how it should be worded. And then Absalom kills that brother, his stepbrother. Again, David, David's, David's uh, family has fallen apart. Okay, now let's insert that, that knowledge, that reminder into Psalm 3. O oh Lord, how my adversaries have increased. Many are rising up against me. Many are saying of my soul, there is no deliverance for him in God. This is a night I wish I had multiple tabs in my Bible. Keep a finger in Psalm 3 and turn over to 2 Samuel chapter 15 with me for just a minute. 2 Samuel chapter 15. <clears throat> 2 Samuel chapter 15, look at verse 12. Some names that are hard to say in verse 12 of 2 Samuel 15, but the Bible says, and Absalom sent for Ahithophel, David's counselor, see there, David's once counselor is, is now with Absalom. And while he was offering sacrifices, look at the last part of verse 12. And the conspiracy had grown strong for the people increased continually against David or with Absalom. The people increased continually. That's the same Greek word that we read in uh, um, verse one of, of, of chapter three, of, of Psalm three. Oh Lord, how my adversaries have increased. Isn't that neat to take a look at? There's so many connections that we could make. Uh, while you're in 2 Samuel also, look at the next chapter, uh, 16 and verse eight, 16 and verse eight. 16 and verse eight. The Lord has returned upon you all the bloodshed of the house of Saul in whose place you have reigned and the Lord has given the kingdom into the hand of your son Absalom. Okay, evil, an evil curse spoken against David. That should remind us back in Psalm 3 of how verse 2 says, many are saying of my soul, there is no deliverance from him in God. You see how neat that is? We have found context. For the sake of time, I've got the whole chapter outlined, things that we could go back and forth to just the same. Um, an interesting one, I think, is the, is the line Blake read, verse 6, I will not be afraid of 10,000s of people who have set themselves against me uh, if you look back at the story of Absalom, Absalom is counseled to get the entire nation of Israel to go out against David. Not only is David, you know, uh, distressed, his kingdom is, is broken, if you will, he's fearful for his life, but literally, there are 10,000s of people who have set themselves against David. How neat to know that context. But as we close tonight, the most important thing in our study of the Psalms is how we use our New Testament Christianity to apply these words. How does it make sense to you and I tonight? You know, and I, and I, and I think that's the beauty of the Bible. As obvious as it is to me that this is a Psalm that was composed while David was, was fearing for his life and running from Absalom, how incredible is it to know that this Psalm means something to you and to I? When I read the psalm, and I want, to, I want to read it again, if you will, Psalm 3. O oh Lord, how my adversaries have increased. Many are rising up against me. Many are saying of my soul, there is no deliverance for him in God. You know, David had nowhere to turn here. Folks are even saying God's not with you. David had nowhere to turn but if you keep reading the psalm as we have, you know that he still had God, and that's all he needed. You know what? He had nowhere to go, but he still had God, and that's all that he needed. 
I thought of this as I was thinking about you tonight. You know, Jesus, he beat death. He beat the, 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 the ultimate evil force, if you will, the force that drives so many, so much of this world, death, right? Jesus beat that, and you know he beat it without his disciples, without his apostles? What did the apostles do? They ran from him. They turned their backs on him. Jesus beat that ultimate force of death, and he did it without his family. We don't, we don't, we don't find them except for his, you know, his, his uh, mother and uh, some others perhaps, but his mother was unable to do anything but mourn, to grieve, to see her son hanging on a cross, and, and Jesus still beat death. You know that? And Jesus beat death. He beat it without government intervention. Isn't that cool to think about? He didn't, he didn't put his hope in the government. It was the government that condemned him, right? So he beat death without the government, and he beat death without the majority vote, right? The majority were the ones that were jeering at him, were cheering at him and saying, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. He beat death without that. What did Jesus need to beat death? He needed faith in his father. David had nowhere to turn but God, and that is totally okay. That's a lesson for you and I tonight. But you, O oh Lord, you are a shield about me, verse three. You are my glory, the lifter of my head. I love that. I was crying to the Lord with my voice, and he answered me from his holy mountain. I felt like I could spend all night talking about the Lord being a shield around me. But when I thought about that, I couldn't help but think about Stephen. I love the story of Stephen. I love it so much, I was thinking that, uh, that, that I like that story. I wouldn't, I wouldn't name my son, or a son, Stephen, uh, because I, I got so... Uh, made fun of for the PH, you know, everybody, did your parents not know how to spell, <laughs> you know, it was, but I would love to have a son who had the character of Stephen that we read about in the Bible. You know why? Because I think those rocks, they hurt. You know, I think they did. I'm, I may be wrong, but if you read the story in Acts, you see Stephen, you know, uh, see that vision of God, and then it says the, the uh, people, the mob, they took him and they started to stone him. And he's calling out to the Lord. You know, I don't, I don't, I don't think he, he, he had that pain removed from him. I think he felt that pain. God didn't, didn't shield him in that way. But God provided the most important shield for him that he could have had. And he provides that same shield for us. Although we may be hurt physically, although we may meet persecution, although we may find death, there is nothing that can take God and our salvation away from us. You, O oh Lord, you are a shield about me. I think about how Paul wrote in Romans, tribulation, persecution, famine, nakedness, peril, sword, death, life, angels, principalities, things present, things to come, height, depth, or anything created can take us away from the love of God. You, O oh Lord, are a shield about me. Verses five and six. I lay down and slept. I woke and the Lord sustains me. I talked about this uh, at the towers at the, at the tower service just a few weeks ago, and when I asked uh, the uh, folks at the towers if they had ever had trouble sleeping at night because of worry or pain, they overwhelmingly responded, yes. We know that same worry, and we know that same pain. And, and, and our trust in God, it, it, you know, it, perhaps it can't take away restless leg syndrome or heartburn that keeps us away at night, awake at night. But I believe that our trust in God can allow us to lay our head in peace and in comfort, knowing that if we don't wake up, we're gonna see our Father in heaven. It can allow us to lay our head in peace and comfort, knowing that, 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 that I'm living this life according to God's standard. A relationship with Jesus, acceptance of his love and grace and mercy can allow us to lay our heads down at night and not be burdened by sickening sin. You know, and I think that's what David tells us in this psalm. I think that's how he speaks to us. I know that because I see so often psalms where David says, I can't sleep because I am taken over by sin. I am taken over by pain. There's an interesting Psalm 6. We see that uh, David says, my bed is soaked at night. From what? From tears, from crying, in agony, from having sin and having upset my God. But here we see a David who's able to sleep even in the midst of his life being in danger. Why is that? Because he knows that he's being righteous. 
He knows that his trust is in God. He knows that, that God will see him through. <clears throat> um, when I was uh, thinking about that, for some reason I kept coming back to Jesus asleep on the boat. Remember that story? We all do, right? Jesus, when he was able to sleep in the boat that was being tossed and turned by the waves. And, and, and how interesting it is for him to be able to rest, to sleep, and the disciples, they're just going nuts, you know? We're, we're, we're dying. Care you not that we are perishing, right? And they go and they wake Jesus up, and the Bible says that he gets up. It doesn't tell us whether or not he went back to sleep. I kind of hope he did. I kind of hope he got up and he said, don't you know that I'm the son of God, that peace be still, you're gonna be okay, where is your faith? And then I hope he went right back to sleep. <laughs> but that's, that too is the same peace that we can have the same assurance that we can have, that our God is king. Let's look at seven and eight. Arise, O Lord, it ends so well, so well for a sermon. Arise, O Lord, save me, O my God, for you have smitten all my enemies on the cheek. You have shattered the teeth of the wicked. If you don't like that verse, there's something wrong with you. You've shattered the teeth of the wicked. Salvation belongs to our God. Your blessing be upon your people. <clears throat> salvation belongs to our Lord. Salvation belongs to our God. Context would tell us that, you know, David here, he's, he's remembering the lion and the bear that he's wrestled and defeated with God's strength. He's remembering Goliath, who's, whose head he took off of his body, right? He's remembering running the table, like I said earlier, of all the Ammonites, Moabites, Aramites, and so forth. He's remembering all that stuff. So context tells us that he knows, you know what? This isn't gonna be the end of this reign. This isn't gonna be the end of me. That's what context tells us. But our New Testament application reminds us that salvation is found in no one else but our Lord, Jesus Christ. That's it. And we can spend every single breath of our life pursuing life in something outside of Jesus. You know what, God will allow us to do that. He will allow us to spend every, every beat of our heart, every breath in our lungs in pursuing things that don't matter. But salvation is found in nothing outside of Jesus Christ. Tonight I pray that gives you encouragement. I pray that gives you strength. I pray uh, it gives you a, a, a value of the Psalms. And I pray that it reminds you of just how how important this book is, how beautiful it is, how it can aid our Christian lives, how, how, how it, can, it can better our relationship with our God. And there's no better way to close a lesson than how David did with the understanding that salvation belongs to the Lord. I love the scripture in Acts chapter four um, where Peter is saying, you know what? I, I can't help but be quiet right now because of how great Jesus Christ is and because of how wonderful his plan is. He also says in that same context that under heaven there is no other name by which man can be saved. Tonight, if you don't know about our Savior, then I pray that you will respond in a way that is willing to get to know him more, more fuller, uh, more b uh, better <laughs> without more. I pray that that's in your heart. If there's any way that I, if there's any way that, 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 that any minister here or, or, or anyone among us can aid you in that relationship with God, then let us, let this church, let, let this be a, 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 a new day, a new year of a relationship with Jesus. I am anxious to talk to anybody who will about God's plan, not, not man's plan, but God's plan for salvation God's plan for you living with him eternally one day. I'm anxious to do that. So if there's anybody in here tonight that needs to respond, I pray that you will. As we sing, I also pray that we have a better relationship, a better love for God's word. Let's sing. It's a blessed place. Oh, it's a